My name's Nick Keefe. I'm the Executive Dean of the School of Science. And it's my particular pleasure this evening to introduce two of our distinguished emeritus professors. In case you didn't know it, 2014 is the International Year of Crystallography as defined by UNESCO. And this evening we have Professor Paul Barnes and Professor David Moss, both emeritus professors of the college and fellows of the college, who started as members of staff on the same day back in October 1968. Not quite before I was born, but I suspect well before or many of you were born. David, however, does claim precedence as he attended the MSc in crystallography in 1963. So they're going to spend this evening explaining crystallography, the past and the future, always in fashion, and particularly Birkbeck's contribution to crystallography. So I'll hand over first, I think, to Professor Paul Barnes. Uh, thank you. Is the microphone picking me up? Okay, uh, good to see you, everybody. My name is Paul Barnes. I'm the first half of the duo that Nick has just outlined. And I'm going to talk more particularly about the history of modern crystallography. And I think I should start, therefore, with a kind of a timeline. Oh, let me get my laser pointer working. And that shows that I define modern crystallography as something starting around 1900. That may surprise you. Um, but there was crystallography before that, but it was what I call old crystallography, mineralogy, microscopes, and so on. Everything changed uh, soon after 1900. And as Nick said in the, uh, in the introduction, that we are in a centenary year of 1914 to 2014, a celebration of crystallography's past. Uh, some say uh, that, that uh, the Bragg father and son were the influential figures. Others say Von Lowy. Um, he made a contribution in 1912. I'll talk about this in a minute. Others say 1901. Um, but I'm not going to get entangled in that debate. Let's just say one is the birth of crystallography. Then we have modern crystallography, which I've divided up into two halves, from 1914 to 1964, and 1964 to 2014. And those areas, I will be covering the birth of crystallography and the first half of that century. And then Dave, oh, and I'll say a little bit about the, my experiments in the very end. That's not working very well. Oh, yes, there we are. Uh, I will say just a little something about my experiments uh, uh, in 2014, and David Moss will also project into the future. OK, what is crystallography? That's a question that I'm often asked. I don't go around saying I'm a professor of crystallography, but it gets out. And people ask you and say, what is crystallography? And I say, avoiding the issue, it's a study of crystals. That only puts you off for a moment. Puts them off for a moment. They then say, "What are crystals?" Um, and now I've kind of developed a line for that. I say, "Well, it's like a brick wall. Um, if you try to build a brick wall, you have to put the first brick down, and thereafter the position of every brick is determined, even though you haven't started the ball, uh, because there is a there is a basically a repetition sequence for the bricks, uh, and by following that repetition, you know in advance where every brick is going to." Is situated. Uh, a crystal is much the same. We don't call it a brick, we call it a unit cell. I'm having trouble with this. Oh, there we are. There's the unit cell. And it contains a small indivisible set of chemicals, let's say in this particular case it's calcium sulfate and five waters. And by laying that unit cell down repeatedly in three dimensions, you can build up a, uh, a crystal. So it's perfection of repetition in order. But there's a difference in scale, of course. A brick wall is a few hundred bricks or maybe a thousand, uh, whereas a, a, a crystal is many million, million, million replications of that unit cell. In fact, the number I calculate in this case is 300 million, million, million. Um, otherwise, it's the same principle. Now, it, people sometimes get a bit aggressive and say, what's the purpose of crystallography? It's just an art. It's not important and most people have never heard of it. Um, well, it's probably the last statement is true. People haven't heard of crystallography generally, um, but I take issue with the rest of that statement, and I did take issue when somebody said that to me, and he, he went away rather wiser afterwards. Um, 
and but uh, I would like to reply with some facts concerning the Nobel Prize. Now, the Nobel Prize is like the final seal of approval on a piece of scientific work. You cannot aim higher than that. That is the ultimate applauded for the value of your work. And it is a fact that the Nobel Prize in the 113 years it's been awarded has been won 28 times through crystallography groups and that amounts to 48 crystallographers. That's an incredibly high number. You cannot ignore that. That's not a chance. It must mean that crystallography is doing something right in terms of basic original research. Uh, so what I thought I would do is quickly go through the history of modern crystallography from the viewpoint of the eyes of those Nobel Prize winners that have figured. And I've got a list here of the various categories in physics, um, in chemistry, and just one in physiology, but a very famous one, Crick, Watson, and Wilkins on the structure of uh, DNA and the genetic coding. And if you put that lot together, you get 16 Nobel awards or 22 laureates uh, you're allowed three Nobel laureates per Nobel Prize. I don't know if you know that. So that's the maximum you, you can share it between three people. Um, and this group of people here are the, the great names in science and in crystallography. Um, and I'm going to not deal with them all because that would take too long. I'm going to highlight the first three or four and then skim quickly through the rest and show you some examples in a demonstration. Uh, is there anyone left out? Yes, there's three people left out in my opinion, but... You can ask me about that at the end. Let's start with William Röntgen. He was a, a, a professor of physics then at the University of Würzburg. Um, that's the standard picture of him and his laboratory. But I much prefer this spooky picture of him, uh, kind of looking in the dead of night, looking for something uh, sinister. Um, and, and he did find it. It, it was the result of this fluorescent tube that he was experimenting on, he found that every time it flashed, a fluorescent screen somewhere else in the, in the lab lit up. And he was concerned, as he should be, by this, and eventually worked out that there was a new form of radiation that had not yet been known. And what do you call an unknown in an equation? You say, let X be the unknown. So he called these X rays because they were the unknown rays. And he found that they had incredible penetration power through most materials, in fact, including his wife's hand. And he took a radiograph of his wife's hand with an apparatus, and there you can see it. You can see the individual bones. And I presume the wedding ring of Mrs. Röntgen uh, 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 is displayed there. And within weeks, the scientific publications were full of this, and the newspapers... And what surprises me most of all is that within three weeks or so, the hospitals were already using um, his invention of X-rays um, to, what do they say, um, use to diagnose bone fractures, locate embedded bullets. I don't know how, that's how common that was then in Munich at that time, and, and identify various other causes. Ronke himself refused to uh, patent his work and, uh, as a matter of principle. And then there was a gap of about 12 or 15 years and nothing happened. Everything was x-rayed, handbags, secret boxes with things inside them, all sorts of demonstrations of um, the wonders of x-rays. But the one obvious thing that they should have done, they didn't do, which is to put a crystal in that beam. Because had they done so, there was a Nobel Prize basically waiting for the taking of it. And in fact, that eventually fell to von Laue, another physicist, in Munich, um, who at that time was a, I think he was a postdoctoral researcher. So let's move the story on to 1912. Max von Laue, that's uh, two pictures of him there. But I should also mention somebody called Ewald. These two met and talked, as they often did, at the Café Lutz. The Café Lutz was quite famous in Munich because the physicists used to meet there every day and scrawl out their ideas on pens on the tables. And the waitresses used to get very angry because they had to clean the tables every night of all the jotting downs of the phys physicists. But I would have loved to have been a, a listener uh, hearing those debates and arguments, which were mainly about whether rays are rays or particles, or whether particles are particles or rays. That was a debate and issue. Anyway, Lau and 
um, Ewald had a chat and they decided that uh, he was doing a theory on what happens when a, when a form of radiation hits a crystal. And he'd done it for all wavelengths. And Lowy said, good, but we've got to have the wavelengths of the X-rays roughly the same as the distance between the atoms. And at that point, they went their separate ways. Uh, Ewald left, Lowy stayed, but Lowy was intent on, obsessed you might say, <coughs> with doing this experiment of pouring X-rays onto a crystal and to see what happens. The unfortunate thing was that all the bosses in his institute, which is a very prestigious institute, thought it was a waste of time. It would never work, it would never show anything interesting. He was discouraged from doing it. So eventually, in the Café Lutz, he managed to persuade two research students, Friedrich and Nipping, to come secretly and help him set up the experiment. Because now he wasn't a very good experimentalist. And eventually they did that and they picked a copper sulfate crystal, which probably looked something like that. Everybody's made a copper sulfate crystal who's done chemistry in school. They're quite beautiful. It just happened to be lying on the bench. So they picked that, they stuck it behind a shield, got an X-ray tube here, a photographic plate behind it, and they saw nothing. They then refined the apparatus a bit, put the detectors in different places, and there they got the beginnings of something unusual happening. The center spot there, that's not unusual. That's just the straight, what we call the straight through beam passing through the crystal, recording its presence. What is unusual are these smudges outside it. The beginnings of what we call diffraction spots, but not very impressive, not very convincing. Uh, a few days later, they repeated it with zinc sulfate, sulfide, and got much better images. Can you see how sharp these spots, these diffraction spots are now? This one showing threefold symmetry and this one fourfold symmetry uh, around that axis. They had discovered diffraction. It was a momentous uh, discovery because it proved, above all, that X-rays were waves rather than particles. And I, I like to illustrate perhaps the concept of waves and diffraction and so on. Uh, with this every day, well, not every day, but uh, a, a scene that you see in your life, which I don't know, have you ever stopped to look at surfers surfing in the sea uh, on a, perhaps on a windy day, and you get a big wave approaching from the left, another one from the right, and you get that feeling that they're going to converge just at the point where those surfers are, and you fear for their safety. Uh, and they do converge, and sometimes they double up into enormous bigger way, the sum of the original two, as in this picture. And the jargon for that is a double up. That's what the surface call it. And they have to learn to recognize when that's going to happen because it is a dangerous moment. And crystallographers call that constructive interference. But sometimes nothing happens. It just fizzles out. Uh, a lot of expectation and nothing dangerous happens. Um, and that's, I don't know what they call it, only surfers in the audience. Uh, if, if you do tell me what you call that, I'll call it a fizzle out until you tell me otherwise. Um, crystallographers call that destructive interference. And it's quite clear what's happening is in the former case, the two waves are in phase. So the crest of one wave is happening at the same time as the other. So they're adding together. But in the other case, they're out of phase. So the crest of one happens when the other one is in a trough, cancelling each other out. And that's really what's happening in the crystallographic pictures, if I go back to there, what you're seeing with these spots is a record of those occasions when the crystal is such oriented that rays that are scattered by different parts of the crystal end up reaching the detector still in phase. So they record their passage with an intense spot. And that's called a diffraction pattern, a record of all the occasions when that constructive interference has happened. Now, into the story now, we move at last from Germany to the Great Britain. Uh, we have the incredible relationship between Bragg the father, William Henry, and Bragg the son, William Lawrence. They're the only two father and son to get uh, a Nobel Prize. Uh, and the son, William Lawrence, was the youngest ever winner of the Nobel Prize, I think at the age of 25. They had heard about Lowy's um, experiments. They said, we want a piece of that action. And they just went relentlessly around and solved the structure of everything imaginable within their sight. And they also made some very beautiful elucidations um, of, the, of the subject and showed in a rather elegant way how to look at diffraction 
uh, one of their um, perceptions was to look at diffraction as a series of planes through the crystal, rather like the way an architect talks of a plan view and side elevation and so on. Um, the crystallographer could talk in a similar way, but not just three sections, very many sections, each one belonging to one of those diffraction spots. Maybe David Moss will go into this in greater depth. I don't have time. And they came up with a formula which predicted, the, one of the most famous formulas in science, that predicted when diffraction would occur. And they came up with a picture which is, appears in almost every textbook on crystallography, giving you an explanation of how, how waves can become separated and then re-meet and still be in phase and record a diffraction spot. So we obviously owe a lot to the Braggs, father and son. They duly got their joint Nobel Prize in, nine, in 1915, I think it was. And that's a kind of a schematic of the experiment that they were doing. Let's roll on a bit more. Um, we now come to a, an incredible person called John Desmond Bernal. Um, you may not have heard of him, but you should have if you're in Birkbeck. Uh, he, was, he had many nicknames, sage, polymath, voluminous knowledge. He was often dubbed as the most knowledgeable scientist in the world at his time. And if you talk to him, you could believe it. He knew every subject there was. Uh, even not just the sciences, across the whole field, except, I'm told, music and sport. So if you're on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, he would be the man you would have as your phone a friend. And you just have to pick two other people for sport and music. He would answer all the questions. There are many stories about his overall knowledge. But in science, he was equally impressive. Now, I've just pressed the on button, which is a silly thing to do. I'm going through... David's lectures backwards. That's giving you a preview of what he's going to talk about and myself now. Yeah, there we are. Um, he solved the structure of many materials from minerals, um, molecular biology uh, things like mos tobacco mosaic virus, liquids, proteins. In fact, he was one, the first person with Dorothy Hodgkin to take a, an X-ray diffraction picture of a protein. Um, but he's probably most famous in those days for having solved the structure of graphite, and it showed there. Now, this to me was quite amazing, because it was an outstanding problem. Why does carbon, it can form a diamond, which is the toughest, hardest mineral known to mankind, and yet at the same time, carbon produces graphite, which is one of the weakest materials known to mankind. One you use it as a cutter, and the other you use it to spread in a pencil or, or as a lubricant or something of that nature. And instantly, when you saw the structures, you could see the answer. Diamond was a simple bond system, covalent bonds, very tough bonds, and they were in all directions, whereas graphite was a layer material, strong within the layers, but the layers were distant, and they could slide over each other very easily. So he did something which I think which Bragg and Lowy didn't do. Not only did he solve a structure, but he used it to answer an outstanding functional problem. We call that structure-function relationship, and it's all popular these days. But I think he was the first to do it. Um, he didn't get the Nobel Prize, and I think he should have, if for that only, apart from all the other research projects that he uh, inspired. He then became professor of physics and crystallography at Birkbeck College, and that's why you should have heard of him. Um, and it's the reason why I came to Birkbeck College, or one of the reasons, and one of the reasons why you're in this room today listening to me talk. Uh, he became very famous. Three of his students, or workers, had Nobel Prizes, all independently. And they would have been a fourth had Rosalind Franklin lived long enough. There's a picture of the Chris early crystallography department that he set up. I don't know what date that refers to. Uh, and these are pictures of the Nobel Prize winners. And he was also very famous with uh, politicians. He was a, a peace um, campaigner. And there's a picture of him, I don't know if you can see it, of Khrushchev, uh, the Soviet um, premier, sitting next to Bernal, chair in the meeting. And Paul Robeson, the great singer, is also in the front desk. Uh, it's well known that Picasso dropped in on him one day and drew a mural on his, the walls of his office. And suddenly Bernal's office structure was the most, I suppose, valued uh, item uh, in the college by a long shot. And when it was demolished, that house, they had to excavate the walls off. And that is in some, does anybody know some museum 
in the, welcome collection. in the welcome collection. Yeah, it's still being uh, shown. So that was Bernal. Um, and he made, as I said, enormous contribution. I'm going to quickly go through a few others. This is Dubai. He's famous for showing that not only could you determine the position of atoms in a crystal, but you could look how they vibrated. So, for example, that top one, that tells you it's vibrating like that, whereas this atom is hardly vibrating at all and equal in all directions. He's famous for that. He's also famous, oh, there he is, sitting in the famous Café Lutz, having a discussion with a physicist. He was the star, apparently, of the show. He knew the answer to every question. Uh, he also invented a camera which would take diffraction pictures of powders. Now, that may surprise you. So far, I've talked about diffraction only from a crystal. Why can you then get diffraction from a powder? Because powders are, in actuality, they are powders where each little tiny grain is a tiny crystal, in most cases. So a lot of the materials that you think of, uh, let's say, salt, sugar, sand, talcum powder, cement, these are uh, not only powders, but each little grain is a tiny crystal. Or we call them crystallites to uh, imply that they're very small. They're about a 1 to 10 microns in size. Remember, the thickness of your hair is about 100 microns. So it's 10 to 100 times smaller each grain than the, than the size of your hair. So when you shine X-rays on them, you don't get one single crystal pattern, diffraction pattern. You get thousands and millions of them, such that you get a variety of patterns. And I don't know how well you can see that, but in the end, the end result is that all those spots join up into rings and you get continuous lines. That is what a powder diffraction pattern looks like. And it's very important because, as I said, lots of chemicals and chemical industry um, produce materials in the powder form, um, and that is the way of diffraction to study them. And that is camera. Now, let's pass it on quickly. This is Bridgman. He made an important mark. He looked at materials not under ambient conditions, but when they were being compressed in between anvils. He was interested in how materials deformed and um, tolerated high temperatures and pressures. He was a rather strange man. He lived his whole life, I'm told, in, in Harvard University. And uh, he was relentless and single-minded in his research. All he did was um, press things together. It said he would squeeze anything he could lay his hands on. And I think you get some idea of the gentleman. You look at the title of one of his papers. If there was a, if there was a prize for the least imaginative title, how about rough compressions of 177 substances to 40,000 kilograms per square centimeter? Uh, well, but that gives you some idea of the man. He died in rather tragic circumstances, which I won't go into. Um, but in fact, his research was quite um, fascinating. Um, what he would do and his like, you would get a, you get a powder put it in between two diamonds, press those diamonds together very uh, securely, and, he would, and, uh, and thereby subject it to high pressure. And he would pass the X-ray beam through the diamonds and out the other side and collect the diffraction pattern, which, as it was a powder, was a series of lines. And here you can see the material change. There's two halves showing you the material changing under high pressure. And one of the big interests of them was to look at how material behaved in the center of the Earth where the pressure is something like three and a half million atmospheres and the temperature is about four, five, or six thousand degrees C. They were also trying to find synthetic diamond, how to, find, how to make synthetic diamond, but that problem was solved by somebody else. Now, Bridgman's legacy, as I would call it, is that, I don't know if you can see this, he elevated crystallography to away from ambient conditions as we are experiencing in this room. Uh, to the extremes of physical, that means temperature and pressure, and chemical environments. And I think that was a very important uh, example to set. My last example is um, a group one this time. This was the discovery of, way of, of electrons and neutrons, and the fact that not only X-rays could form diffraction patterns, but so could particles. Neutrons and electrons are particles, and that was a surprise that they produced a diffraction pattern. And I'm going to give an example of this now. Um, uh, I've asked somebody before the lecture started if they would be, not, not you, Farida, you're later. You're, you're example number two. Um, I'm going to interrogate 
somebody, not by speech, but by using particles. Um, and I would ask if, is there a Bob Taylor in the house? Could you stand up, sir? Yeah. Uh, this is what, I'm, I'm doing this just so you get an idea of what it's like to be a subject of a neutron experiment. These are particles, these are like neutrons, and it's like this. <laughs> Enough? Enough already. Retaliate. Right. Okay. Now, if I ask you behind, as a result of that sequence, I want you to draw a picture of Bob using the data that you just saw, which was what happened to those balls coming off. Would you be able to do it? No. That's what we effectively we do in crystallography. We pour particles or waves onto people, we collect the, the scattered pattern, and from that we work backwards and work out their shape. Well, that's cheating slightly. Um, that's almost what we do. Um, I, I'm, I'm cheating slightly because when I said that those squash balls are only particles, they're rigid. But neutrons and electrons have a slight wave property about them as well. And there's another reason why I'm cheating, is that we wouldn't look at a single molecule, a single Bob Taylor. What we would need is a Bob Taylor crystal. That would be clones of Bob Taylor, as you see in there, <laughs> forming a crystal. Thousands and millions of clones of Bob Taylor all acting in the same way and in phase. <laughs> and that's what that experiment is basically demonstrating. Um, so I think what we do is quite clever in its way. Right, I'm going to bring you up now to the, to the 2014. Um, the original experiment I showed you in 1912 required three things, a source of X-rays, a sample, and a recording device. And that was a, a, a tube, a, a copper sulfate crystal, and a very primitive fluorescent screen. Now, the physics hasn't changed. What has in the, in, the, in the hundred years since then, what has changed is the technology <coughs> with which we do it. We now do it with x-rays, not from a tube, but from an accelerator. Those, you've heard of, uh, presumably, the Hadron Collider. These are rather like scaled-down versions of the Hadron Collider, except they're not colliding, they keep going. And as they keep going, they generate incredible intense sources of x-rays, the most powerful source of x-rays known to man. So we bombard our crystals now with incredibly strong radiation. Our crystals can be a whole variety of materials from biology to material science. And our detectors are fast, rapid, and they plug straight into your laptop. So you leave the experiment when you're finished and you have the data uh, on the lap uh, in the train going home. And as for samples, there's a whole list of samples and subjects that have been studied in the crystallography department in the biological sciences school. Um, and what you might notice is that the material science materials tend to crystallize naturally. Uh, uh, there's ticks there for all the materials that will readily crystallize. Whereas most of the biological materials you have to persuade to crystallize, sometimes very aggressively and sometimes less so. And that is a, a bone of contention sometimes amongst the practitioners. Um, I've got one penultimate slide, which is the research project of my, one of my last PhD students. I don't expect you to read it or understand it. Even I don't, really. Um, and it, but it just shows you the complexity of the experiments that are carried out these days. This particular student was doing something incredibly difficult. She was looking at water at, what did it say, uh, supercritical water at 218 bars pressure, 374 degrees C, when steam and liquid become indistinguishable. It's so high in temperature and pressure. It's called the critical or supercritical point. And she's aiming those at ammonium nit uh, cerium uh, nitrate. Uh, and while she's doing that, she's doing it inside a synchrotron hutch. She's not allowed inside the hutch, so she has to do it all remotely with, with remote control because the, the radiation levels inside the hutch are so great they would kill you with no time whatsoever and she's collecting data on diffraction patterns and imaging all simultaneously. That's the complexity of experiments um, that uh, are tackled these days with the modern technology. But the physics of diffraction is the same as it was a century ago. And now I'm going to finish off with a demonstration. 
Um, and at this point, um, I want to, I want to, I want to, um, a volunteer. Is there any volunteer? I like a woman volunteer. What's your name? Right, Frida. Would you come to the front? <laughs> you won't regret. You won't regret this. And I'm going to call my uh, research assistant, Martin Vickers, up as well. Yeah, you can stand over there. And what we're going to do now is... Oh, what's happened to here? Ah. The projector's gone off. Um, image off. I switch off system. PC laptop. Uh, I think I switched that one accidentally. Right, let's right. come back. Yeah. <laughs> this it happens all the time. <laughs> Can you just shut it down to start it up again? Yeah, thank you. Shall we talk through the beginning? Yeah. We'll talk through the beginning while Nick sorts that out. Um, so what we're going to do here now is an experiment. We're going to try to cook some chemicals up. We're doing this experiment symbolically. It's not for real, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> it, it may be an X-ray synchrotron experiment, or it may be a neutron experiment. This is a, a detector that Martin is putting into position. This is going to collect the diffracted pattern in time. This is basically a pressure cooker. So, uh, have any of you done pressure cooking at home? Uh, you, well, you know that what you do is you pour meat and veg into your vessel, you, you, you put the lid on tightly, and it, the temperature goes above 100 degrees C, and the pressure goes high, and your cooking is faster and hopefully better as a result. Perhaps you could take that out. Do you to turn on yeah. the... No, 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 not yet, no. So, are you up here? Along the way. Yeah. Now, this is symbolically the vessel that we're going to make our chemicals in. Um, and Martin's just shown it to you. And we, we've painted the inside black. That's to symbolize, we put liners in here, because the material we're going to put is sodium hydroxide at high temperatures, and that will attack uh, the metal um, vessel. So we put a PTFE liner to protect that. Um, Teflon frying pan. Yeah. If you can put that back, and I'm going to now symbolically ask Farida to make up our solution of chemistry. We're going to try to um, make a zeolite. Let's go back. One of those two there. Right, Frida. Um, take your stirrer. Oh, do you I'll want to take the lid off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, are we doing this symbolically? So what we have here, we're going to make some sodium hydroxide. You're doing A-level chemistry now. Yes. Do you add sodium hydroxide to water or the other way around? I'll believe you. Okay, I'm not sure it's right, but um, I haven't done any chemistry since A level. Um, so, if you'd like to take that, and shall I pour that in? And we want some sodium hydroxide, so that's this one. It hasn't spit up, so I guess we've done it the right way. Uh, we need a source of silicon, so we need silica. The international code for that is black for silica, red for oxygen. Okay. And what have I said? Oh, we need some aluminium as well. So there's some aluminium hydroxide. All right. And now, uh, maybe you can hand that to Martin. Martin will pour that into the vessel. lid on. Now the purpose of the experiment is to produce this zeolite shown here. 
These are catalysts. They're very frameworky structures. The one we don't want is that one there. Um, remember, if, if you produce the wrong thing when you're doing pressure cooking at home, there's nothing you can do because you don't know what's happening. Here we do. We're actually doing an experiment. We're looking at what's happening, and we're changing the, we might change the course of the experiment as a result of what we see. So we want to produce this one at the expense of that one. Uh, that's part of the uh, inbuilt goal of the experiment. Um, right. I think we're ready to go, Martin. Oh, I need to explain. This is a beam pipe here. That will be bringing in neutrons or X-rays from uh, one of those synchrotron or spallation sources you saw. It'll go in th through the walls of this vessel, of the, of the furnace. This is a furnace surrounding here. Into the walls of the vessel, get diffracted, as I've explained to you, and be collected by this uh, detector. And this will send the result up onto the screen. And you'll see a real-time symbolic uh, <coughs> portrayal of the uh, synthesis of these zeolites as they're happening. OK, I think you need to get things up and going. Do you want me to do the checks? Yeah, oh yes, that's right. Uh, when you do these experiments, <laughs> um, the, 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 the levels of x-rays are dangerously high, ridiculously dangerously high. You would never stay in one of these places while it's running. So they force you to go through the hutch. And I'll ask Farida and Martin to, to do that. And you have to hit various checkpoints to show that you've walked your way through it and then found a tramp lying on the floor or something. Um, <laughs> uh, because it's the curtains for them if they're there. So let's, can you do the check out, the two of you? Okay. okay, well, we need to know where the points are. There's one over there, one yeah. in that corner, one over there. W one in that corner, yeah. one, uh, one in this corner. Yeah. Okay, so maybe you can check that one. I'll check that. And when you check these, you have to actually hit them if they're there. <laughs> and uh, um, it happens in this certain sequence. I hit one. In reality, it's just one person check. You didn't have to check these two blocks. You tend to hit yours and hit the one down here. And of course, while you're doing that, you have to look for anybody who's hiding under anything. Just in case. Everything uh, all right? Everything's fine. The checks have been done. OK. Now, that's the diffraction pattern that we see at the beginning. It's featureless, because we haven't started the experiment yet. I, ca I checked this earlier. It's a broad, featureless curve. That means it's just liquid or amorphous materials are inside there. But what we hope to see is some peaks grow out of that, which signify certain crystallites growing, hopefully the right ones. Can I put the beam on? Yes, please. Have you got the furnace on yet? You need to heat up? Yeah. Can anyone see the pointer? Oh, there we go. Right, we're going. Now, this synthesis, in, this is real data. We, uh, we're, we're obviously changing the circumstances slight somewhat. But this is real data that was collected by a research student. Farida is, if you want, the research student acting as. Um, and we're, go we're going through a sequence which lasted about 20 to 30 minutes. You can see the time scale, I think, written on the side. But we're going through it now 10 times faster, just to take it less time. And you can see that even though the material is hot heating up with the furnace, um, it's still staying featureless, but any moment you might see what we would like to see. You see, I've got where I expect to see the peaks, the solar peaks. That's the one I want. I, there you can see it forming. Can you see those peaks? Are they in line, Martin, with the solar Yeah, we've got someone else there as well. Something else there? Some where? On, on the right hand side? Um, you can see four extra peaks. Um, well, yeah. well, that could be zeolite A, the ones we don't want. I think you better put the temperature up. I, I don't want zeolite A. We want to have a clear result here. Okay, temperature. Oh. With a bit of luck, that will make zeolite A unstable, and sodalite should hopefully remain. Yeah, is it, do you think it's coming now? Yeah, yeah. What do you think, Farida? Yeah. It's been good. It's been good. Yeah, I think we're on, the, it's definitely the, those right-hand peaks are coming down to zero. So what we've done here, as I said, is quite amazing, really. 
we've done uh, a synthesis, a reaction, um, in which we look at what's happening and we change the course of the reaction as a result. It's like doing pressure cooking at home and changing things, even though you haven't actually put your hand inside and sampled uh, the cooking. And now we're coming to the end of the result. It looks like those peaks have died away completely, those zeolite day, and we should have now pure sodalite peaks remaining. Good, that's the end of the experiment. Now could you turn the switch and the beam off? Wait for you, it's not safe to go in yet. Now, um, I think, you, well, at this stage, we've we done an excessive experiment. It was only a symbolic experiment. O obviously, things do actually change from amorphous liquids and uh, solids into crystalline solids, but we don't think that happened. Obviously, that hasn't happened here because we were doing a symbolic experiment. But it would be nice had we done so, wouldn't it? Do you think we might have crystallized the material there? Anybody? Let's open it up and have a look. Frida, would you like to collect your specimen? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, that's, I think, more or less the end of the lecture. That's a a brief summary of what I've said. Modern crystallography, is it reality or is it magic? And at this stage, I hand over to David Moss. who will talk about the crystallography of proteins. <laughs> There's going to be safety <laughs> <laughs> issues. Thank you. Take care there. Thank you. Right. Okay, right. So I'm going to start in the, the 1960s and then I'm going to move through to the present day with particular emphasis on protein crystallography and uh, the contribution uh, that has been made in the subject. I just thought I ought to, in case anybody's not aware, why we are interested in determining protein structure. Well, all, almost all the chemical processes that are taking place in you right now are controlled by proteins. Uh, so enzymes control the speed of chemical reactions in you and other proteins control uh, the uh, input and output of small molecules into your cells. And if we want to modify uh, the function of these proteins, we must understand their structure. And structure means the relative positions of the atoms in the protein molecules. Um, proteins, of course, aren't just important in us. Proteins occur in other living systems and some of those systems are toxic to us. And so if we want to intervene in that toxicity, uh, we must also uh, understand the structure of uh, proteins. So why crystallography? Well, proteins consist of thousands of atoms, sometimes tens or hundreds of thousands of atoms. And if you are going to determine the position of all those atoms, you need an equivalent number of observations. In theory, you need one observation per position that you're going to determine. In practice, because the quality of X-ray diffraction is not very good, you need many more observations than you have atoms in your protein. So there are very big numbers involved and very large calculations. 
So there will be a need for automating the collection of this data and the processing of it. Um, just to put this in, in, in context, um, if we look at the protein structures solved in uh, 2013, uh, almost 10,000 structures were solved and nearly 9,000 of those were solved by X-ray crystallography. Um, 508 of those were solved by another technique, uh, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, and 232 of those were solved by electron microscopy. Now, nuclear magnetic resonance and electron microscopy have an advantage in that you don't need to have crystals. But they also have some significant disadvantages, uh, which I won't go into now. Uh, and those disadvantages account for why the numbers are, are very much smaller. However, I do think um, in the future we shall be seeing many more structures determined by electron microscopy. I'm not too sure about uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. So you can see from that that X-ray crystallography makes the major contribution to our knowledge of protein structure. This is, how, this is what happens when you determine uh, protein structure. First of all, you've got to have a protein crystal. Uh, and most protein crystals don't crystallize naturally. You've got to actually make those crystals. And that is a significant drawback, really, with the technique. Uh, and it always has been. Uh, and that's probably an area where we've made least progress over the past 50 years. Then you have to have a detector to detect the diffraction pattern, as you've seen from Paul's talk. The x-rays are diffracted and they have to be detected. Uh, and there's an image plate. And that's uh, on the right there. We'll see in later slides a better picture of that. You have a diffraction pattern. And then from the diffraction pattern, you do a lot of calculations and you end up with a structure. Now, if we go back to the days before that sort of thing was routinely possible, we're in the era of small molecule crystallography, when we were only able to... D determine the structure of, of molecules maybe with tens or possibly at most a few hundred uh, atoms. And that's the sort of equipment that was around in the 1960s, the sort of equipment we had a lot of this in, in this department uh, here, in the basement quite close to where we're, uh, where we're meeting. And uh, what you see here is, uh, I won't, I'll go up to and point to it, um, the crystal would be mounted there. Now then, the crystals that you need for X-ray crystallography are very small, uh, only of the order of a millimetre, so you can't see the crystal, but that's where it would be. And uh, this is a telescope that would enable you to see it. And then in from this side, uh, you'd fire X-rays at the crystal, and round here would be uh, a cylindrical camera. It's a cylinder with some photographic film in it. And that from that photographic film, you would rec on that, you would record the diffraction pattern. So that's an early camera. That's called a Stubbins camera, named after the engineer who uh, invented it. Um, oh, sorry, that's not the... Right. Um, soon, um, health and safety got involved with X-ray crystallography. And this is a Stubbins camera in here, enclosed in a, 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 a special plastic box because it has been discovered that X-rays are very harmful if you receive a, a heavy dose. And in fact, we had uh, one technician in the college here who used to paint his finger with fluorescent uh, paint to detect where the x-ray beam was, and the, the, he, he lost the end of one of his fingers through doing this. So and that, this also shows you uh, the, uh, an x-ray tube here generating the x-rays, uh, and uh, also there are pipes here for cooling water, for cooling that tube. And the x-rays were generated by firing uh, electrons at a copper target. And then having got your picture on photographic film, you had to develop it. And this is a picture of one of the dark rooms uh, that were also in the basement here, where the pictures were, were developed. 
And of course, then you had to, having, having produced the diffraction pattern, you had to, from that, determine where the atoms were. And that was a, a job for calculation. There were early computers, and this is a picture of somebody working in Zakharov. He, he eventually became the director of the University of London Computer Centre for a short time. And he uh, was uh, developing these computers in the laboratory of Donald Booth, who was uh, one of the people in what is now the computer science department. And these early computers were used in crystallographic calculations. Uh, it was very difficult because often you had to repeat the same calculation twice until you got this, well, several times until you got the same answer twice before you could, could be sure of it. There's a, another uh, picture of a 1950s computer. And these computers were, in size, very large. And here uh, we had a computer called Atlas. Uh, and Atlas had a memory of 32 kilobytes. Not, not megabytes or gigabytes, but kilobytes. And the 32 kilobytes occupied the basements of two houses in Gordon Square over the, over the road. Two houses, just that, that was just the central memory in the, in the, in the basement. Uh, the ground floor of the two houses was occupied by the peripherals. And uh, at the time, we thought this was a really vast computer with its 32K of, uh, of memory. And that enabled us to solve the structure of some small molecules. And I, I solved the structure of antimony trichloride complexes with this uh, computer. And anyway, what did you get when you solved the structure? Well, um, quite often you just used projections through the diffraction pattern because the calculations, if you used the full diffraction pattern, would take too long. Uh, and this was absolutely essential if you didn't have a, a computer and you know, do the calculations by hand. But the early structures were solved from projections. Uh, so you, you took a section through the diffraction pattern, and a section through the diffraction pattern corresponds to a projection through the molecular structure. And what you see here is an electron density map of diopside. Diopside is a mineral, it's a, uh, a precursor of uh, asbestos, and it's a magnesium calcium silicate. And because X-rays uh, are diffracted by electrons, what you get is an electron density map. And the atoms that have most electrons, like calcium and magnesium, produce these large peaks. So this, this large peak here corresponds to a superposition of a calcium and a magnesium atom up there. So you interpreted these projections uh, in terms of this uh, atomic structure. And if you had three of these projections uh, from different uh, directions, this enabled you to build up the three-dimensional structure. So that's, that's how it was done. Um, this is Harry Carlyle, um, and he's looking there at electron density maps. You can just see one in the, in the background here. And you had to look at them on a light box. Uh, so he would be interpreting that map to see where he could fit in the, the atoms. Now, it was in the 1970s that uh, protein crystallography really took off. Um, people like Kendrew and Perutz had been doing structures of myoglobin and hemoglobin from the late 1950s. Um, but uh, these were sort of one-offs and enormous undertakings. But gradually in the 1970s, things became uh, more automated. Now, as I've already mentioned, the challenges of protein crystallography, uh, you've got thousands of atoms, and therefore you've got to make thousands of measurements. Protein crystals diffract X-rays weakly. So the sort of X-ray tube that we saw in that picture uh, earlier on would not produce X-rays that were strong enough. We needed much stronger X-ray sources. And the other problem, which is still a problem today, are crystals of proteins are often very difficult to grow. 
Now, just to give you a, an idea of the scale of the problem, the number of atoms, this is a, this is a, a molecule of a, uh, an eye lens protein which comes from the eye lens of turkeys. It's found in birds and it's responsible for the hardness of the avian eye lens. And that's got tens of thousands of, of atoms in it. And uh, what you see there are the little bonds. These lines in this picture are the bonds between the, between the atoms. So that's the size of the, 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 the problem. So we need high-intensity X-ray sources, automatic collection of X-ray data, and high-power computers. That's a, an image plate of the sort of thing that we uh, have had in the department here. And uh, this would be where the... Uh, this would be where the image, the diffraction pattern was recorded and, and here would be uh, a rotating anode giving a stronger source of x-rays because if you rotated the target you could fire a more intense beam of electrons at it without it melting. So you use a copper target because copper tr transmits heat very well and you rotate it and you can fire a very strong electron beam at it and get a uh, a much more intense beam of, uh, of X-rays. And that, uh, setups like that were used for uh, solving protein structures um, in the 1970s and 80s. That's a, that's a, a picture of a, uh, an X-ray uh, pattern from a, a protein. This is from another eye lens protein. This is from a protein that's found in your eye lens, beta crystalline. Uh, that's laid down before you were born, in fact, and stays with you for the rest of your life. And this is this protein's had some mercury atoms added to it. And the diffraction protein, as you can see here, is, is very messy. It's got, it's got lots of spots, but it's also got all this diffuse scattering as well. And this means that the actual intensity measurements, when you want to measure the intensity of these spots, the precision of these measurements isn't very good. And that's why you need many more observations than you have atoms. Many more, because if you don't have systematic errors, quantity can make up for lack of quality. There's another picture, a slightly uh, uh, cleaner picture, of a... Uh, an X-ray diffraction pattern from that uh, avian eye lens protein, delta crystalline, that we saw a couple of slides back. Uh, that, that was an interesting pattern for us because it had 14-fold symmetry. There are, there are 14 of these blobs. And when we first saw it, we went, why on earth are there 14 of these blobs around there? And it turned out the, 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 the crystal structure has helices in it that have seven-fold symmetry. But that's a another story. Uh, this is a, a colleague working on the structure, or she's just solved actually here, the structure of gas gangrene toxin. And that was the sort of computer used at the end of the, the last century. And it was at a time when it was thought that it might be important to look at structures in three dimensions. And down here at the bottom, there are some glasses that enable you to see these structures in three dimensions. And what Claire's actually doing there is comparing the structure that we determine with three other similar structures from uh, human proteins. So gas gangrene toxin, that's a toxin that occurs in bacteria, in, in particular Clostridium perfringens, and is responsible for gas gangrene. It's a terrible, a terrible toxin that causes people to have their limbs amputated, in fact. Uh, I'll say a little more about that in a minute. Right, when we come on to the 21st century, this, is, this, this thing here is perfectly adequate for determining a, a protein structure these days. And that's enormously more powerful than our Atlas computer, enormously more powerful. Uh, and that's all you need, you, or you can solve the structures, in fact, on your, on your laptop nowadays. Uh, as for the, the uh, synchrotron sources, of course, well, a lot of the time we use, um, sorry, X-ray sources, we use synchrotrons. Now, this, this ring here is a synchrotron. And X, uh, electrons go flying around that ring uh, at almost the speed of light. And you can take X-rays off 
from that uh, uh, ring at uh, points where they are made to go round a corner. And that gives you uh, uh, intensities many orders of magnitude more than were given by the earlier copper tube. And that's the sort of thing you really need to get going with uh, X-ray crystallography. Not quite what you can have in the, in the lab here. And, and next to it here, this, this, this thing here is a nuclear reactor. And that, that generates neutrons. And of course, neutron intensities over the past 50 years, neutron sources haven't increased in intensity to the extent that X-ray sources have. So uh, neutrons uh, make, uh, uh, still make quite a, a modest con con contribution to X-ray uh, and protein structures protein structures. Right, here we are. Um, let, let me show you the, the result. Uh, that's the result of this uh, toxin, alpha toxin. Uh, having, having processed uh, the, the data, you get out a structure which in diagrammatic form is what you see here. And the, uh, I don't know, the, you put the maybe the, the lights go down a bit. Um, uh, uh, There we are. Um, yeah, you, you can see. the molecule actually is, is red, and it, it's down here, and it's lots of consists of lots of helices, and it's also up here in blue. And what it's doing is attacking a membrane. And this, what you see here in the in the white and the the the, the uh, grayish green, that's a, that's the membrane of one of your cells. It, it might be a muscle cell, and the uh, the 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 this is a, a molecule which attacks the membrane and causes it to be permeable. So it'll make a hole in the membrane and destroy the cell. And when you get gas gangrene, these toxic molecules um, attack your muscles, usually starting in, in the infection in the foot, and they will work right up your leg. And if you don't have your leg amputated, they'll eventually reach your heart. And destroy that muscle as well. So it's total destruction of, of your muscles. So and, and we know from this structure how it happens. How it happens. And that's the first step, of course, in determining how you might try and stop this happening. Right, what are the future challenges? Well, um, there are lots of future challenges, but I've just focused on one here. One of the deficiencies of crystallography is it just gives you a static structure. Uh, NMR can actually do a bit better than that and can show you some of the dynamics of a structure. But it only shows you a static structure. To fully understand the function of a protein, you have to understand how it moves. Because nearly all proteins, in all the for them to function, have to move. Some of their atoms, or maybe all their atoms, have to move. And you need to understand that movement. And that movement takes place on time scales that may be milliseconds or even seconds. And that means, and to, 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 to model that, you need to do calculations like molecular dynamics, what are called molecular dynamics calculations. And at the moment, we can't reach those time scales of milliseconds or seconds because our computers just aren't fast enough. We might get to microseconds. So that, that's a challenge of the future. When we have faster computers, and it, it's coming on, we shall be able to understand more about the motion of proteins and how uh, that motion contributes to, uh, to their function. So that's a future challenge. I'd just like to thank uh, a colleague, uh, Professor Alan Mackay, who gave us some slides. Um, Professor Slingsby, uh, another colleague, who, who collected some of the images of crystals that you've seen. And uh, I'd like to thank Dave Holdershaw and Martin Vickers for their big contributions they've made to this presentation. Thank you for listening to me. Anybody want to come and join us in case there are questions? Anybody got questions for David or Paul? Or? Mm. <laughs> uh, you said there were three people who didn't get the Nobel Prize. Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Quickly. You can press home. Oh, there we are. Uh, Peter Evald, who talked to Lowy about how it inspired him to do the first attraction in the picture. Then there was Desmond Bernal, who I think should have had one. And my third candidate, of course, is Rosalind Franklin, who died before she had the opportunity to, got, to have got a Nobel Prize, although everybody agrees she would have got one had she been alive. They're my, that's just my personal opinion. Yep. They, uh, it, it's the definition of crystal as a, as a block in the unit cell, as a brick in the unit cell, is, is generally the case, but there are things called incremental structures, aren't there? Yes, you have different that's, a, that's Alan Mackay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Same, yes. Sure, sure. Yes, yes. Yeah. I could go on with other examples of... And also yes. the top of a wall, you usually find that the bricks go across the other way. Well, that also happens in real crystals. It's called, in, it's called surface reconstruction. Because the surface has got less strength or more strength, like a surface tension, so you can change the structure on the surface. So there are lo lots of exceptions in, in, yeah. in, in real life. Mm. Any more questions? Yep, lady there. I think it happened gradually. Yeah. It happened gradually, but um, surprisingly long, really, because people didn't really realize they were dangerous. I think in the nineteen certainly in the nineteen fifties they realized they were dangerous, but not perhaps how dangerous they were. Well, they spent the longest time thinking it was healthy. Well, I know that well, people used to take X-ray pictures of their hands and feet daily because they thought it was cool to do so and see how they. Developing. Yeah. Surprisingly long time, really. Any more questions? Yes, in there. I was wondering if you talk about Rosalind Franklin, uh, do you feel that her greatest contribution was uh, an experimentalist phase of it, uh, growing crystals, or um, as a researcher, a theoretician? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, she certainly was uh, good at the um, experimental side. And, of course, her experimental results, some of those contributed to the discovery of the DNA helix. Um, I, don't, I honestly don't know, and uh, we would have been able to answer that question more easily had she lived just a few years longer, I think. But I think it's also the case that... Um the big step was realizing the diffraction patterns were from a helical shaped structure, which was something quite new. I think the indications are that she was aware of that, um, but so were a, a number of other people. It was a kind of a pooled wisdom uh, was happening. We know that um, Crick and Watson met up with Bernal and Lonsdale in Birkbeck in, um, at one stage and discussed the whole matter. There was a meeting between the four of them and Booth, who you mentioned in the cathedral. Was it the case that Rosalind Franklin um, had a good um, idea that she was this extra-matter presence that um, wasn't willing to commit herself until she was absolutely sure? Uh, yeah, that may well be. That may, yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, I've he heard it said that crystallography was a much more welcoming for women than many other scientific yeah. profe professions. Yeah, in this, these early you days. You see the examples? Well, yeah. yeah, there were Dorothy Hodgkin, Kathleen Lonsdale. Yeah, was that because the, the men welcomed them in? Or I think people like the well, 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 but now it's did extremely welcoming to women. Women, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it, sometimes the women were too welcome, I think. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't his dean, but I think things were different back then. <laughs> 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 interpretation back then. Uh, a lot now more relied on computers. Very, computers very much in the world. Right. Right. But back then it wasn't so much reliant on that. A lot more sort of intuitive and uh, right. uh, uh, knowledge needed. And then women came to the mm. side of it. happened to be that. Mm. Make, make of that what you will. You could investigate X-ray diffraction patterns by looking at optical diffraction. And that was often used. Is that because it's having a standardised database for every 
Uh, there is, a, yeah, there are databases, yes, yes. Yes, yes. But you still have to try many, many techniques. So you've got, you know, things are grown in wells and you have to have many, many, maybe hundreds of wells with different, slightly different concentrations and different magic ingredients and then you... You can disseminate the information, but if you've got your crystal you want to crystallise, even having all that information available, it may still be a difficult job. But you can, you can use it to guide you. Okay, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank Paul and David very much for an interesting evening, and you're all welcome to Science Week tomorrow. Yeah.